now it's my pleasure just to uh, make a connection with our dear friend Wolfgang Mida. And uh, of course, it is, there is nothing better than a healthy mesh of lies and phrases, proverbial language in the diaries of Joseph Goebbels. Uh, please, dear friend, go ahead. Okay, <clears throat> thank you, Rui, for a nice introduction. Uh, I want to start, uh, Rui and Marinella, by thanking you and your team in Tavira for all of your incredible work to make our symposium 14th colloquium possible, virtual, but as we can tell, it's working out pretty well. This morning I had to teach, but eventually I had a time slot, so I was able to listen to my <clears throat> three friends, Fionula, Carl, and Frantisek, and of course you gave Frantisek's talk, uh, Rui, and that was very nice. Yesterday's opening of the conference was wonderful. Uh, I enjoyed the speeches. The mayor was very supportive as usual. And the concert, I've already listened to the concert twice now. And I thoroughly enjoyed the, the 15 uh, proverb pieces and, and so on. Uh, today, uh, it's a particular pleasure for me to have my close, close friend, Kevin McKenna, sitting next to me, almost. He's only about five miles away from me. <laughs> but uh, Kevin and I have been colleagues in the Department of German and Russian at the University of Vermont for 35 years, I believe, approximately, or more. And we actually get along after all these years. And as you can tell, uh, Kevin also studies proverbs, as he will show in his lecture. One other thing I wanted to mention, and uh, I wrote to Jula Pajolet, of course, but it is so wonderful to know that our close, close friend and the star paramiographer, Jula Pajolet from Hungary, turned 90 uh, yesterday, I believe, right? Rui, is that correct? I think so. Okay, well, my, my talk this time is a bit more on a serious level. Uh, showing in a way that proverbs are not always sacrosanct and that proverbs can be misused depending on what person is using them in what context. So my lecture today is then there's nothing better than a healthy mush of lies and phrases, proverbial language in the diaries of Joseph Goebbels. There are five abridged volumes of Nazi Germany's Minister of Propaganda, Joseph Goebbels's diaries, which now have been published in 31 volumes. I have read them all. I finished about two weeks ago, almost 15,000 pages, so don't do it. As the deceptive master of propaganda, he used his diaries as a way to get his thoughts, ideas, visions, problems, and neuroses off in his chest. As a Catholic, he even regarded his diary as a substitute for confession in church. On March 23rd, 1925, he wrote, I am tired. I want to go to bed. Good night, my dear book, my careful confessor. I tell you everything, everything. Here I am human. Here I am allowed to be good night. Wherever one looks, there is hatred, scorn, brutality, lies, and anti-Semitism, and hardly a trace of humanity, let alone self-criticism. As early as July 24, 1924, he wrote into his diary, there's nothing better than a healthy mush of lies and phrases. No wonder then, that so many proverbs and proverbial expressions are found in his writings. Everything in Goebbels' writings resolves, revolves around propaganda for National Socialism, for Adolf Hitler, for himself, and ultimately more and more for the total war and the most horrendous anti-Semitism. Goebbels was well aware of the importance of proverbs and vernacular expressions, 
asserting in 1934, we have to speak the language that the people understand. He who wants to speak to the people, as Martin Luther says, must watch the people's mouths closely. The following examples will show that Joseph Goebbels has taken his own statement very much to heart because in his diaries, he speaks to use a proverbial expression without mincing words. And this to such an extent that one can find whole clusters of proverbial expressions and proverbs. Goebbels employed a kind of a hammering style which is demonstrated by an accumulation of or repetition of certain words, images, phrases, and slogans. This linguistic strategy is evident in the accumulation of proverbial expressions as in his early anti-Semitic hate-filled tirade of July 4, 1924, where he uses both the proverbial expressions to need a strong hand and to show someone the door. Quoting him, we don't have a strong hand in Germany, but put an end to experiments and platitudes. Start with seriousness and action. Show the Jewish pack, which does not want to comply with the responsible idea of national community, the door. Hit the Jews as well. Money gamblers, show them the door. Germany longs for the one, the man, like the soil for rain in the summer. Lord, show the German people a miracle, a miracle, one man. And of course, that man became Adolf Hitler, as you know. Violence and inhumanity in the language of national socialists is clearly evident here, with Goebbels repeatedly pushing the ostensible brutality to the extreme. Goebbels, as well as Hitler's favorite proverbial expressions concerning the fate of the Jews, were to have nothing to laugh about and to wipe the smile of someone's face. Goebbels has always used both proverbial expressions as arrogant and prophetic threats and that demonstrate his inhuman obsession with power. Quoting him, in any case, he says, the Jews will have nothing to laugh about in the upcoming world. There's already a fairly united front against Judaism in Europe. This is in 1941. In his writings, threats and predictions are constantly connected. And the tirades in his diaries about anti-Bolshevism and anti-Semitism know no bounds. His irrational hatred of Jews that emerges is terrifying. And all of them refer to the so-called final solution of the Jewish people, 1942. Verbs like erase, exterminate, eliminate, liquidate, and above all, eradicate, are unusable today or can only be employed with caution because of their murderous use during the Nazi era. Here are but a few examples. 1936, the Jewish plague must be erased completely. Nothing should be left behind. Five years later, the Jews are the lice of civilized humanity. One has to somehow exterminate them. Otherwise, they will always play their tormenting and pestiferous role. And again, in 1942, I am of the opinion that the more Jews are liquidated during this war, the better Europe will be after the war. This is a man who has a PhD in German literature from the University of Heidelberg. But let us now turn our attention to the actual proverbs that are part of the intentionally popular language of national socialists with their old wisdom and sayings, stylistic blunders, drastic and blunt images and proverbial expressions. The wide range of language available to Goebbels in all of his communications creates a propagandistic Pied Piper effect. As a kind of proverbial leitmotif, the classical proverb, gutta carvat lapidem, which is common in English as the constant drop wears the stone, appears several times. And I was so pleased this morning 
when I listened to the concert that uh, Bruno Baltois actually, as number seven, played a little piano piece to exemplify this particular problem. That was just wonderful. In and of itself, the proverb expresses the idea that something can be achieved with perseverance. For Goebbels, however, it becomes a psychological formula that solidifies and probably justifies his grotesque obsessions. So he writes, the propaganda work of our secret channels is exemplary. We operate according to the principle, the constant drop wears the stone. Another example, our propaganda abroad is gradually working. The constant drop will wear the stone here as well. We have to be patient and always hit into the same notch with tenacity. And that's exactly what, of course, he did day and night. The proverb is apparently his principle for the continuation of national socialist violence, the unabated prolonging of the war, and for the murderous persecution of Jews and other victims. Other examples clearly show how, once again, how proverbs are used to explain, relativize, or obscure what has happened or what is about to happen in the colloquial way. I'll give you three examples here. He writes, the world is against us, but we don't need to grow gray hairs because of this. No day is over until the sun has set. And he uses that proverb the, all the time even in 1944-45, when he knows the war is lost, he still says that particular proverb, no day is over until the sun has set. 1941, Berlin is very busy, but you get the impression it's worth it. Here too, one has to strike while the iron is hot. And here's a very interesting one from 1944. The Bishop of Münster, very famous anti-Nazi uh, cler clergyman, Count Clemens August von Galen, argues against our retaliation against England. Even after the heaviest air raids, one should not act according to the principle, Bible, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. This is not Christian, but also not German. One might wish that Bishop Galen would be in the middle of the bombing for three or four hours, then he would probably think about this question differently than he does today. In other words, <clears throat> Goebbels is arguing, of course, we want to go with the proverb, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. The retaliatory proverb, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, from the Bible, Exodus 24, 21, 24, Matthew also, 538, that Goebbels used here on February 23rd, 1944, and in contrast to Graf Garland, considers completely appropriate and justified, had been cited by Goebbels' great role model, Adolf Hitler, in a speech on January 30th, 1942. What was once a metaphorical proverb or a figurative expression was converted by Hitler, Goebbels, and others into a dangerous and fatal act. Hitler perverted the Bible proverb to justify the actual annihilation of European Jews. Let me quote to you what Hitler had said on that day, 1942. We are well aware that the war can only end with either the Aryan peoples being exterminated or with Judaism disappearing from Europe. On January 30th, 1939, I have already stated before the German Reichstag that the result of this war would be the annihilation of Judaism. For the first time, the genuine old Jewish law is applied, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. The perversion of the eye and tooth proverb eventually escalated into the murder of millions of innocent victims showing that misused proverbs can lead to people dying. That is the problem at times with proverbs, their polyfunctionality, their polysemanticity, depending on their polysituativity, all of that 
gets combined into making one and the same proverb at times very positive and at other times very negative. For Goebbels's aggressive way of profiling himself linguistically, there's probably no better expression than to mince no words, uh, which becomes a revealing leitmotif in his diaries. He writes, talk to an overcrowded room. I didn't mince words, he never did by the way. And again, I get going at full volume and don't mince words, the Führer enjoys it. That was the biggest thing for Goebbels, that Hitler liked what he had to say. One gets the impression that proverbial expressions seem to appear more or less automatically because they are part of his colloquial journal. Of profound importance is Goebbels' triple use of the phrase, the die is cast. We, we know it from Julius Caesar, of course, because it expresses a certain level of determinism. Once decided, there is no other way, the, he writes, there is the invasion of Austria will happen, the press will be manipulated, and the enemy will, to put it bluntly, get the shock of his life. Or he writes, summon to the Führer, even at midnight, the die is cast, invasion of Austria on Saturday. Or the die is cast, we're getting the press and broadcasting services ready for the fight. And finally, it can be concluded that the die is now cast. To cut a long story short, the German sword takes the floor again. The enemy will see that we are stronger than we have predicted. It should be mentioned here that Winston Churchill also used the phrase, the die is cast several times. Of greatest interest is its appearance in Churchill's comments about the Normandy invasion. He writes, faced with depth desperate alternatives of accepting the immediate risks of postponing the attack for at least a fortnight, General Dwight Eisenhower boldly chose to go ahead with the operation. The die was irrevocably cast. The invasion would be launched on June 6, 1944. This passage is about an important decision in world history, namely the defeat of Nazi Germany. And no one will deny that the proverbial expression has a serious function. But Goebbels's proverbial statements of, for example, no defeatism, but also no castles in the air, and our strike must come like a bolt from the blue, like the blitzkrieg against England, right? are merely manipulative and propagandistic in comparison. But there's also a statement that shows some deterministic wavering on June 16, 1941, at the eve of the war against the Soviet Union. He writes, the Führer says, whether right or wrong, we have to win. This is the only way. And it is right, moral and necessary. And once we have won, who will ask us about the method? We have run up our tab, there's your proverbial expression, we have run up our tab so much that we have to win. Because otherwise, our entire nation, us at the top with all that's dear to us, will be eradicated. So let's get to work. This shows the thinking of Hitler and Goebbels. The heroic fatalism that expresses itself here was based on a deep-seated fears and the feelings of revenge this generated. The fact that the tab had already run high boosted a renewed rage of extermination. A shocking radicalism is evident here, one that will not shy away from anything. Finally, there is the proverbial expression to exterminate or eradicate something root and branch. In German, mit Stumpf und Stiel ausrotten. It's well known to eradicate with stump and stalk, like to pull a tree out of the roots, which Goebbels used as a leitmotif. The fact alone should no longer make its use permissible today. 
the expression reduces the National Socialists' acts of violence to a graphic common denominator because their goal ultimately was the barbaric extermination of all people perceived as enemies. Goebbels writes, quoting him here, the Red Plague, Bolshevism, the Red Plague will now be eradicated root and branch. And a couple of years later, the political joke will be eradicated root and branch, in fact. But here is the worst quotation of all. He writes, the Jewish terrorism must be eradicated root and branch from all over Europe. This is our historical mission. Together with Bolshevism, Judaism will undoubtedly experience its great catastrophe. The Führer reiterates that he is determined to ruthlessly cleanse Europe from the Jews. One shouldn't have any sentimental impulses here, he writes. The Jews deserve the catastrophe they are experiencing today. With the annihilation of our enemies, they will experience their own annihilation as well. We have to accelerate this process with cold ruthlessness. And in doing so, we are providing an invaluable service to suffering humankind that has been tortured by Judaism for thousands of years. Imagine that this man writes this into a diary. You, know, you usually think of a diary a little bit differently, don't we? Joseph Goebbels actually wrote this in his diary on February 16, 1942. The only thing missing here is the terrible term final solution, which appears, don't worry, which appears three weeks later in his diary as a final solution to the Jewish question. In the willingness to eradicate oppositional and disruptive people and groups, his radicalism uh, no longer knew any limits. The language of the diaries reveals a willingness to annihilate that no longer shies away from anything. The end result of these unimaginable and incomprehensible plans for extermination was depicted by the well-known Holocaust scholar, a colleague of Kevin McKenna's and mine, uh, Raoul Hilberg of the University of Vermont, in his seminal work, The Destruction of the European Jews. From a linguistic and paramiological point of view, it is shocking how Goebbels's authoritarian and inhumane use of proverbs and proverbial expressions led to harmful and ultimately lethal victimization of others. The expression to exterminate root and branch with the meaning of completely annihilate is known in German, which Dumpf und Stiel ausrotten since the 16th century. But it should now, I think, after its repeated diabolical use by Joseph Goebbels, together with proverbs such as the ones you know, Arbeit macht frei, uh, work makes set you free, und jedem das seine, to each his own, as well as the German proverbial expression, etwas bis zur Vergasung tun, to do something until the gassing starts, belong to the unacceptable and unusable expressions in the German language. In the same year, in 1942, that Goebbels wrote the last diary entry just cited using the root and branch expression, Nobel laureate Elias Canetti wrote, and I'm quoting this here, it's an interesting quotation. If people, us included, if people had even the faintest and most unambiguous notion of life and drive within them, they would shudder away from many words and phrases as they would from poison. In other words, it behooves us to think of the language we use. One has the feeling that Canetti wanted to take Goebbels to task here in 1942. Of course, he had heard him speak. But this relentless talker and writer, Goebbels, lacked any self-critical linguistic insight. In his drama, Danton's Death from 1835, the German dramatist Georg Büchner 
had demanded rightfully, follow your phrases until you find the point where they are embodied. Joseph Goebbels did not do this. Otherwise, he might have been able to curb his spoken and written linguistic rage. Instead, he made his aggressive propaganda language a dangerous weapon that, and was, that regrettably included proverbial language. Thank you. Thank you very much, dear friend. By your beautiful and strong, uh, um, it's very, very drastic, the situation that you are living. And uh, your communication is, in my opinion, a very good alert for lots of things that can happen in our nowadays. Nowadays, I have now some uh, questions. The first one is from Luis Tozina. Uh, it's a professor at uh, uh, the university in Spain, and uh, he have been last year in our colloquium. He asked you, dear professor, are there any similarities between the use of proverbs in the diaries of historical political fiction and the post on social media by today's politicians? Or would you say that the restriction in the length of message prevents the use of proverbs on media such as Twitter? such as Twitter. The, the, the person who's asking the question in a way answers it. Twitter is in a way too short to bother with, with proverbial oh, wonderful president, former president Barack Obama, uh, who, who delighted in using proverbs uh, in, a, in a serious emotional matter, in an in a, in a empathetic way, in a positive way. Uh, uh, Trump uh, uh, shies away completely from metaphorical language, also in his longer speeches. Now, that might also have something to do with who his speechwriters are, you know. Uh, but nevertheless, when, when uh, President Trump speaks freely, he is not a person who, who is uh, particularly proverbial. And, and uh, um, so, in the long run, I think whether a politician, a modern politician, uses proverbial language or not is to a certain degree a individual or personal uh, style. Willy Brandt, you know, for whom I have always had tremendous respect, was quite proverbial and he was a very intellectual person. I think with Goebbels, it was almost like, you know, we sometimes talk of proverbs as linguistic automatisms. I think they just came naturally, just flowed right out. You know. um, but uh, Khrushchev, since Kevin is sitting there, Khrushchev was a person who was utterly proverbial and not necessarily negatively. I mean, he, he used them as part of his cu cultural peasant upbringing, let's say. You know, Elena Carter, our wonderful colleague, from St. Petersburg, as we all know, who comes to our meetings has written about Khrushchev's use of proverbs. I hope that helped. Well, we saw Zina said, and thanks you, he said, you read me like an open book. <laughs> Thank you very much and apologize for the long question. You know, you know, Rui, let me respond to that. Notice how wonderful it is when we, when we talk with each other. You can use your proverbial expressions or proverbs in any shape or form with irony, with humor, with seriousness, you know? And, and, and that I think is the fascinating part of paramiology that proverbs are not dead, proverbs live. <laughs> They're a little bit dead in collections, but the minute <laughs> they are employed, uh, they carry not just linguistic meaning, they carry emotional meanings. Yeah, yeah. Now is Uti that there is use and misuse of some proverbs, 
could you mention if there is some old proverbs that have got so strong negativity after Nazi use that they are not anymore used? Yeah, well, yeah, I can, I can give you a, a wonderful uh, American proverb. I, I would say that the most negative stereotypical, and I should say, there are many stereotypical proverbs in all languages that we ought not to be using. But the, but the worst one, and I've written long papers about it, is of course, the only good Indian is a dead Indian, which, which started in the United States approximately during the Civil War, and especially afterwards, when America was expanding westward and was driving the Native Americans out of their natural uh, habitats and put them onto reservations. So the American soldiers who after the Civil War had not anything to do uh, became brutal with our native population. And the proverb, the only good Indian is a dead Indian started to be used. The problem with that proverb is Audi, glad Audi is there, uh, is of course, it has a structure as Matikuzi would say, it has a structure. The only good X is a dead X. So you can say the only good German is a dead German. The only good Negro is a dead Negro. And, and I have found all of those variants. The one thing that I've never understood is why that proverb has caught up in you caught on in Europe. That is an why, why would some Europeans have spread that proverb in Europe. So the Germans say, no ein guter Indian, no ein toter Indian ist ein guter Indian. In Italy, it is known. Yeah. But so I would argue that is a proverb that ought to really disappear. And yet I still find it from time to time in the media. Many of the anti feministic proverbs, let me give you one, uh, uh, an older one. A woman's tongue is like a lamb's tail, talks all the time, you know, shouldn't really use that. And it has pretty much died out, Audi. You know, proverbs, some proverbs last forever. One hand washes the other, strike while the iron is hot. Other proverbs die and ought to die. And since we have new worldviews, we create new proverbs, and some of them are very nice, but they're also bad ones. Proverbs are as complex as human life, with all of its beauty, hate, contradictions. Thank you very much, dear friend.